You're doing the best. <laughs> Welcome uh, back to the Vermont House Human Services Committee. And it's um, first up this afternoon is going over um, H711, <laughs> um, a walkthrough of the current draft and a possible vote. All right. Good afternoon, Katie McGlynn, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, so we are looking at the new draft of H711, draft 4.2. Um, and I'll just walk you through the changes. I've highlighted them so you can find them easily. The first, I want to make sure that everyone has it. It is on our web page, and you can pull it up. And it says draft 1.1, 1 .1, 3, 4, 22. Uh, draft 4.2. 3922. Oh, because I was looking at the wrong bill. Okay. Oh, it's like me. You might have to refresh your. Okay. Okay, so the first change is on page two and we're looking at the advisory committee section. And we talked about having some new lead in language um, with regard to who would be on the advisory committee. And there was also language that was suggested by Grace, whose last name I've forgotten, I apologize Grace. Um, but yesterday we talked about adding language in addition to having um, the membership reflect diversity of Vermont. Um, we added the language and ensure inclusion of individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder. And Grace's email suggested to add um, and their family members whenever possible. So that is reflected there. And then on page three, subdivision J, this is the two individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder including at least one of whom is in recovery, one member appointed by the Howard Center Safe Recovery Program, and one member appointed by the Vermont Association of Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. The next change is in subsection C at the bottom of page four. And this has to do with the powers and duties. Um, so this first sentence comes um, from Grace. The advisory committee shall demonstrate broad ongoing consultation with individuals living with opioid use disorder about their direct experience with related systems, including medication assisted treatment. Oh, I should have changed it to uh, medication, medication assisted treatment. That might be right. I have to see how we determine Title 18. Residential treatment, recovery services, harm reduction services, overdose supervision by the Department of Corrections and involvement with the Department uh, of Children and Families Family Services Division. To that end, oh, it's Department for Children. You're right, you're right, thank you. Okay. Um, the second one there. Okay. To that end, the advisory committee shall demonstrate consultation with- oh, Can you hold on a second, make sure we're all in the same place. Sure. So that first sentence that we just went through was um, the language that Grace sent. And then the next sentence, starting on page five, line four, to that end, um, this is the sentence that um, we kind of built collectively yesterday. <laughs> the advisory committee shall demonstrate consultation with individuals with direct lived experience of opioid use disorder, frontline support professionals, the Substance Misuse Advisory Council and other stakeholders to identify spending priorities. Okay. Can I ask a question about uh, not this section, the one before, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, the two members. Yep. Yesterday we talked about, or at least I think one of the witnesses and testimony said, uh, we should try to make sure one member is actively struggling and I just don't see that re reflected, and I just want to make sure we're okay with that. <laughs> uh, if I may offer a comment, I think uh, 
where my trust lies on that one is having Howard Center Safe Recovery in on that. Okay. Um, and they're working with folks who are in active um, use Perfect. or are trying to get onto into recovery. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next change is on page six, subsection F, the meetings. Um, this was when the Commissioner of Health was to call the first meeting of the advisory committee, and you changed it from May 1st to June 30th, 2022. And then that brings us to section 4773, page seven. Um, and this is the section the, where we're designating the health department as the lead state agency. Um, and we've updated the name of the, the administrator, the national administrator who's doing this work. Um, so it's the National Settlement Fund Administrator. And that change is also on lines 19 or on line 20, National Settlement Fund Administrator. So they're consistent in both places. And then if you remember on line 12, where department is highlighted, um, we had state there, and then for consistency, we've changed it to department. And then, okay, next we're on page nine, subsection C. If you remember, we spent some time here. This is the priority list of how um, funds are to be used um, from the special fund. And so there is a conversation about how do we integrate the idea that reducing overdose deaths is a priority. Um, so we built it into the lead in language. Priority for expenditures from the opioid abatement special fund shall be aimed at reducing overdose deaths, including the following. Um, there was a place where I had um, included um, a qualifier um, about opioid use disorder, I was asked to remove it. I think I was actually in the previous subsection, but that's gone. That's why you're not seeing anything highlighted there. And I believe that was it for changes in this draft. Okay, that's it. What I would, um, before we, <clears throat> go any further, I want to ask if there are questions. Um, and failing questions, I sort of want us, even if it is silent reading, to read the entire bill before we um, <clears throat> before we go any further. I know you would like the change to, from in the DCF title from Department of to Department for. I can't make the change here because I have it open at my computer and the Pink Lady. So while you do silent reading, I'm going to run across and close that document so I can edit here. Okay, I will be back. Will that make it draft 4.3? It would make it 4.3. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just to mention, uh, I came in late and I apologize, but That's okay. what was the total amount of the settlement money available? Does it mention that any place or not? Um, it is not mentioned any place right here. Right now, what we have heard is it's approximately $63 million. Uh, however, um, there was that discussion yesterday that um, there is an ongoing discussion about how to, about a third or fourth um, <clears throat> settlement. And so right. some of that money might come in here. No. The amount that is uh, available now or at some point is that over a period of time? Yes, 18, 18 years. 18 years. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, so it's less, it's 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 less money than some of us might like or have yeah. hoped. Um, and it is um, oh, I'm gonna forget the percentage. Maybe someone else can tell me. Um, there it's it's like 70% of the national uh, so 70% of the settlement dollars that are going to come to Vermont, 15% will go to um, localities um, and 15% will morph into the state general fund. And, and then there's also a third aliquot, isn't there? Third, this is the third part. The okay. third part is the 70%. Yeah. And in order for us to access that, 
the terms of the settlement agreement require that we set up the advisory committee. Right. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, but I just want us to sort of read. Uh, Tapper. No, Madam Chair, I just want to make sure I'm reading the right one. Is it draft 4.2H7113922, 11.06 a.m.? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you. And if anybody has a question, just say it out loud. This is the bill we sent back to ourselves, right? Or essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's why it's a little convoluted in the beginning. Yeah. We, we're, we're, right. We sent it back to ourselves so that it would be out there in public so folks could see it. Um, Topper, I see your hand up again. Um, is that a legacy or? Yeah, I just. Forgot to take it down. That's okay. I have a um, point that I just noticed um, on H. Where are you? Uh, page three. Uh, it's a member of the committee. Page, an individual with experience providing substance misuse treatment or recovery services within the Department of Health preferred provider network. Um, I don't know if recovery services are in the preferred provider network. Um, I think that's more so treatment. Mm -hmm. right. okay. so I know that up above on uh, F, we added a primary care prescriber with experience providing medication assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. That was a point of feedback we received. And then. Um, so uh, I, I think that your point is well taken. If we want, if, if our input, what we're looking for is flexibility of an individual either providing misuse treatment or providing recovery services. So, um, Katie, we are on page three, num H number eight um, on line eight. And actually, it's line nine <clears throat> um, to delete. Um, um, within the Department of Health's preferred provider network. Okay. Got it. Because it was brought to our attention by Dane that recovery services are not necessarily within the prefer preferred provider network. We've gotten we've gotten to page three. It's a pretty long bill when you think mm -hmm. just for creating it. While you were gone, Katie, I just sort of said as people read, if they come up to something to say it out loud. Okay. 
I have something. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, appointed by the clinical director of the alcohol and drug abuse program. Um, yeah, this is sort of a tricky one because you've already passed a bill changing the names. Thank you for that as well. What? We changed the name of the alcohol and drug abuse program. Yeah. And cite the, so we're about to cite a oh, old name. An old name. So that, whatever that the, be changed. You can just put two change. A's and D's and P's. Um, <laughs> Programs. I, I, I mean, you can have a general reference to. Um, don't, I mean, are, are, are we still having a clinical director of ADAP? Well, it won't be ADAP anymore. Oh. But that change won't take effect until if, July. If right? Senate, yeah, but this is on this I'll is in statute. It. This is codified, so it will exist forever. Um, I guess you could we could add a little section that gives um, uh, st no statutory um, revision authority for uh -huh. me to go in and change it over the summer. Yes. Okay. Well, whatever we have to do to do that. Or its predecessor to your or whatever. Or, or we could say, or its successor, successor, successor and interest. Sorry. Yeah, I know what you meant. <laughs> successor. What, uh, did you? Yeah, that's cleaner. Let's do. That. We did do that in another bill. Of course, that's I remember that. I know that's very good. <laughs> so does that make? It? I, I have another question. Are we still on page three? Um, we, yeah, we're, we're on the advisory committee. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be later in the bill, but what I'm thinking of, I'm just going to bring it up. Um, is there any place here that provides um, payment for people participating? Is that later in the bill? Uh, I, the bill. Area? I think there is. Okay. There was per the end. All right. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to make sure. Because <laughs> most of these people will be paid in their jobs, but yes. not everybody will be. Yeah, right. Nope. Okay. It's on page seven. And this yeah. is why it goes to um, government ops. They had some comments on our other bill, too. Oh, they did? Yeah. So when we say other on um, page seven, when we're talking about that payment issue, aren't we really meaning other members not there in their paid capacity? Um, <coughs> yes, and I think 32 VSA 1010 addresses that. Addresses that. That's sort of the standard boilerplate that we use. Thanks. Another question? Yeah. On um, um, bottom of page seven. Um, this is just a organizational question. I don't know if Katie knows the answer to it. So I know that this, I know that special funds our and how they are spent are generally managed by the department relevant, but aren't the funds managed by um, the finance department? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, <clears throat> I know that kind of hard because a lot of us I think I know for fact three of these they're still on page five so it's kind of hard for us to <laughs> going back okay forth. okay Sorry. okay we're going too fast well, okay <clears throat> thank you don't hold that down. hold your thought my thought I, I'll email and see if I can get an answer
This is more a definition. Okay. Can phrase something. This is on page five. Are we there yet? Mm -hmm. Line 19, 20, and 21. Because the ongoing challenges of the Yopa increases with marginalized populations. And I'm wondering what are the ongoing challenges for the marginalized population? We don't say that. Is there a known issue? Um, part of what <clears throat> the um, model builds um, and what the settlement is talks about is that uh, minority communities in particular are um, and communities um, of color and communities um, <clears throat> experience extreme poverty are more likely and, um, and have more have are more likely or and have greater barriers um, to, uh, to treatment to treatment and so uh, this is um, it just seems sort of open and okay. I, I think I understand it. It's, it's really something we have to put in. We, we, I mean, it's right. part of the uh, the expectation that this is focused on that. Gotcha. I mean, that that's, that this we pay that this is paid attention to. Thank you. And Chair? Yes, Tapper. On page uh, eight, is the only time that these funds are going to be uh, distributed is during the budgetary process? I believe so, yes, as it outlined here.
We're at page eight. Where, where, where was your question? I got one for page nine. I can't find it now. Oh, right here. It's on the bottom of page seven. Okay. Um, bottom of page seven. Um, lines seventeen and eighteen. And it could it could be held within the meaning of thirty two BSA chapter seven sub chapter five, which I don't know what that says. This is the finance and management question. Yeah, I got an answer. Okay. Um, so this is from Sarah Clark, who works for JFO. Um, uh, finance and management has overall oversight of special funds, but individual funds can be managed by agencies and departments. Uh, health department in particular manages several special funds. I think it's okay for the health department to manage this fund. Okay. Um, so she said, though, I'm not sure if Commissioner Gresham has an opinion or should weigh in, but I do um, remember Monica saying she ran this by him at one point. Whenever we're there, I have a yeah. <laughs> There'll be two appropriations committees that look at this. Look at <laughs> Usually, finance and management has an opinion about special. Well, yeah, no. I <laughs> <laughs> well, and they may well share their opinion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, is it okay to ask about something on page nine? Are we up to page nine? Okay. So. It seems really odd to me that preventing overdose deaths and other harms is number eight on the list. And I realize it doesn't mean it's any less important, but it feels like it should be number one on the list. I support that. <laughs> This list comes from the settlement, right? Not from us. Well, they just, <clears throat> they just need to be in there, not necessarily. Right, it does not yes. prescribe order. 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 And in fact, you know, to be honest, some folks, some states don't necessarily use the exact words. Um, it was the, uh, I want to say advice or opinion of, um, the folks, the attorney general's office that we very, that they were, they were very clear they'd like us to be as um, specific and as detailed around that. Okay. So on the bottom of page eight, number five says addressing the needs of pregnant or parenting individuals and their families, including babies. I just wondered, there's no other place here where they talk about the children of, um, um. And then do you think that covers it if we want, if anyone, if some of the money were to be used maybe for children who were left parentless or, you know, due to? I believe that families are allowed to be um, included and um, and maybe on number, I mean, once or twice we could, or whether that could be. We added in number two, something yeah. be support for individuals and families. Treatment and recovery. Okay, what do you think? I did just want to make sure people see. Uh, 
there are a couple uh, points in which they reference child care. Oh, in, uh, in priorities. The oh, in priorities. Okay. It seems because it says and their families, parenting individuals and their families, hmm. addressing the needs. It's not just about pregnant and babies. It's about broader families. And yeah, it was hard to tell. Including but not limited to. Right, right. What? For number five at the bottom of page eight. What? It says individuals and their families, it's including babies. Pregnant or parenting. I mean, I, I mean, I think it, I mean, if you want to add it somewhere else, I think to two. <clears throat> what was the answer to, to Teresa's issue on hey, preventing overdose deaths and other harms? Were we going to put it earlier? Yes. So we're going to make number one. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I mean, if that would make you, if, if that, I mean. No, I think if you, as long as it's there, and I think it is under five, and that's a fine. It's just they seem to focus so much on the newborns and the pregnant. So that was my. Um, I think. I mean, I think what you. I think you're making a good point. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Hang in there with that. Hang in there. <laughs> Hang in there. Like it's already 14 pages. I don't want to make it. Okay. Um, so, um, I mean, I think Ray had a good idea yeah. to support for individuals and their families in treatment and recovery. I, I might say, isn't it? Support for individuals in treatment and recovery and their families. Yeah. Families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good thing you turned off that um, open file. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's not laughing. I don't know if they it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're on page. Uh, Dan still has some on the I'm going to refer back to page nine, but it's on page 11. So I don't know if we're on 11 yet. I'll wait. Oh, well, I have. But also, while well, we're talking about adding. We already have age. We have age as, an, as a thing at the top. Um, um, as, as, that's part of the, the general thing when they said um, one of the top things around. Um, I forget what it is. Um, and one of the ones where it says, in, in particular, an overall thing in particular about sex, age, gender, da da da, and age. Age is in there. On page 11. What? Can I say something about page 11 again? Yes, I think okay. we're on page 11. On page, pardon me? I was just checking with the committee. Yeah. On line 14. We, uh, we say evidence-based program, but if we go back to page nine, line 13, we say evidence-informed and evidence-based. And I'm wondering if we should be have it the same. Good <clears throat> catch. Sorry, you're on, I think my oh, line oh, numbers 11, don't match you. Line first. 14. So for oh, subdivision A, expanding comprehensive evidence-based. Base, it should say evidence-based and evidence-informed because okay. that's what we do on page nine. And evidence Thank you. I also have one on page 11, uh, 3B. Um, for all of the other ones, we use pregnant individual, but for 3B, we say for women with co-occurring opiate, opioid use disorders. I'm wondering. Individual. Pregnant. Individuals. I think it's still focused on pregnant individuals in that one, correct? 12 months. Taylor, where are you? I am on uh, page 11. For us, it's going to be a uh, line six, so it's okay. three B. And change the word women to individual, correct? Yes. Yeah. Got it. So, Madam Chair? Yes. On what uh, Taylor just brought up, um, what, what is that? Is that last uh, phrase for up to 12 months postpartum needed then? Yes. Oh. Okay. Yes. 
only because the section overall is focusing on assisting pregnant and postpartum individuals. So saying that postpartum up to one year. That's correct. Yes. Following up on what Dan said, though, what about that same thing, B, line five on page 11, 14? Will we not want it? What did you say before, Dan? It was evidence based mm -hmm. and what? Uh, evidence informed. Okay. So you say evidence based here, but we don't have evidence informed. I don't no, know. I think she added that. Oh, she did. Oh, I added it to 4A. Do you want it on 3B also? Yes. 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 Good catch, Carl. Thank you. Okay, my academic hat pops in, and there is a very difference between evidence informed mm -hmm. and evidence based. Because mm -hmm. evidence based requires there to have been all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Stuff is a very academic word. Yeah. <laughs> Very scientific. Very it's scientific. On 12 as well. It's just much more limited though. Mm -hmm. It's 12. Right. Mm -hmm. But again. And then, so I guess everywhere it says evidence. You might just need to do a word search. search. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Line 14 is the same. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. Oh. Uh, I have a clarifying question on page 12. Um, and the, but wait a minute. Let me yeah. let him catch, up. Let me catch up to us. It's more of a question to the committee, not necessarily that it, okay. that it. Um, I know, and I assume most of us in the room know um, what warm handoff I, services I, I, mean. I was getting to you, I had that on my phone. But I don't know if it needs a definition, if it that is- like jargon somehow. Fine in statute, just, just putting it out there. <laughs> if one day someone will look back on this and say, what is a warm handoff <laughs> yeah. service? Who are the people who run this? <laughs> yeah. What does it mean? It's not um, a cold, because cold it's, right. <laughs> because <laughs> even for uh, starting on page 11, it's expanding the availability of warm handoff programs. Yeah. And, and then it gives examples, but then the following page B says again, expanding warm handoff services. So it's a little bit like, rather than describing it, it's just saying it again. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by it? I'm curious myself, like an easy, well, it's like a friendly. Yeah, it's folks who are in community who are not the service providers, but are connecting folks to the services that they need. It's a warm handoff because they're still connected. Um, they're not so just saying, they don't just say, go over there. Yeah, 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 go talk to them. Go talk to those people. Well, say like they're gonna find them, walk them over and say or you look, you look up warm, uh, warm handoff um, services on Google and it gives you a whole bunch of stuff that says exactly what you just said. Oh really? Yeah. And it is a really. I'm not show. seeing it. I, I, <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, I'm. I mean, I you know, synonyms and anonyms. I, the first thing that came up for me was warm handoff. Uh, warm handoff is a transfer of care between two members. Blah blah blah. <laughs> where a handoff occurs in front of the patient and family. I mean, just. There's different definitions, but they're all very similar to um, the seamlessness and, and that, is, that is transparent and that is there. Here's a suggestion instead of warm handoff, I just see it as well. <laughs> uh, the transferring a client from one provider to another in a culturally responsive manner. I wonder if. Is that too much? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Sorry, not, it's not, just about, it's not just about culture though. Mm -hmm. A theme not, I mean, it's only about culture. It's, it's broader than culture. Maybe we should put the definition in the. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's so. I mean, another. It's so clear. Uh, like, to me, it's so clearly defined. I, I, I just found over a dozen sites where it's all dealing with the same issue. It's very clearly defined. To me. I don't think there's questions to, to me. If I can find it. I knew what it meant, but it, it, I think if you're not. Necessarily in human services, you don't. Mm -hmm. Well, luckily, government, you know. Yeah, 
Well, luckily, if they're in the service community, you'll know. With Google, you don't even have to specify. I'm not saying that Google is the end all be all here, but that you don't have to specify even in the clinical world. But if you type in warm handoff, there are definitions. Yeah, I mean, it's. So, it's yeah, I mean, there are uh, there many years. I still there, there is the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, and then there's something law that, that does seem to talk about warm handoff. Okay, great. Oh, there's already statutes somewhere else about it or law. <laughs> okay. I will close that can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> the people would, are, this is impacting know what this means. means. Right. You might want to just write down that definition in case somebody asks. Because <laughs> 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 at least if it was me, I wouldn't be able to find it when I was actually pushed on the floor. <laughs> This one here is for noted. <laughs> Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Topper. On page 12, A, first line, expanding services such as navigators. Um, do we have such things? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where are they? And the emergency department. They're in emergency rooms. Um, and that's what they call navigators? Yes, they're actually called navigators. Okay. Never met one. Well, um, go, go ahead. I think, isn't um, Representative Gina a navigator in our emergency room in Chittenden County? I think so. He might be. It's called in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, Maybe he's on the on call team. And I think um, Topper, and I think some for in some places they reference that's the name they use, and in other places that is their function, which is. There is someone who has a different title, but whose job is to help the patient figure out their way, navigate through um, through the service for in, to the next step. I thought it was because they use bells in the emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, like a triage for that is uh, top page twelve. Twelve. Okay. So we're leaving it. Is that? I think we are leaving yes, it. Thank you. We just want to just want um, to close that loop. That's all. I was looking at A here about navigators. Oh, okay. All right. On page James? 12 again, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, on line 10 E, hiring additional workers to facilitate the expansions listed in subdivision five. Um, so anyone can hire workers or, or is it limited or? Um, if I'm reading, if I'm reading this correctly, subdivision five is expanding the availability of warm handoff programs and recovery services. And then, so this means where are we? Is, uh, line, ten. line ten. Yeah. Line ten. So just what's listed in ABC. And so, so the money can be used to be hiring more people to be handoff people, more right. handoff people. So, so in other words, the money can be used for personnel. Mm -hmm. So in, in essence, the health department will present in their budget proposal about how they will uh, propose utilizing the funds 
essentially we'd evaluate that based upon the criteria we set out in statute. Um, and like that, <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, that's what, so that's one of the things that they could do topper. They could, maybe they'll focus on that. Maybe they'll focus on something else, depending upon the advice they get from the committee mm -hmm. and from individuals, um, individuals in the field and workers and people experiencing substance use issues. Right. And I think this, I mean, I sometimes equate this to the ARPA and the other funds, mm -hmm. which have, you know, there's this whole boatload of money and some people go, let's spend it here. And it goes, no, no, can't do that. You know, it doesn't fit the criteria. Mm -hmm. So that may well happen here. And right. so we'll just, between, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things that, you know, I suppose it's, this will come under our jurisdiction for making recommendations, right. we have to evaluate whether they're, what they're proposing meets the intent. Of right. This. Yeah. There's lots of things they can do. So that. are we on page 13? 13. 13. Um, I have a question, sorry, at the bottom of page 12. Okay. Um, just looking at um, six A and B, um, I just noticed, and this could be limited by the statute language, but providing evidence-based and I guess evidence-informed treatment and recovery support uh, for individuals while transitioning out of criminal justice system. And then B uh, is increasing funding for correctional facilities to provide treatment to inmates with opioid use disorder. And I just wanted to highlight, maybe it's nothing that we can change, but um, essentially what I'm reading here, while somebody is incarcerated, funds can only go to treatment. And it's only once they're transitioning that that, that can also go to recovery services. Oh, no, I think you could do both. Mm -hmm. So what do we add on 6B to provide treatment and recovery support. and recovery support. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where, where is that? Um, I mean, I'm on, on the bottom of bottom of page twelve. That's uh, six. Oh, line se seven, 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 line seven, seventeen. Eighteen. Yeah. Okay. There's six A and then six B. Gotcha. Thank you. My only question to that is: Are there recovery supports? in our correctional facilities or do they only offer treatment? This money could be used to yeah. implement one if there is isn't one. That, yeah. Treatment is relatively recent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I have, is there, is there recovery supports in there? No, but that might be something that comes out as a priority. Well, if you mean as opposed to cold turkey? Yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> supposed to being discharged and then dying. Mm -hmm. they, well, in Chittenden County, they have a whole team now working on helping those folks so that because that was happening so often that they put together a team to work on how do we reach out to these folks. Oh, that's good. So they would be a good team to put some in <clears throat> testify before this committee, maybe. <laughs> Um, the one question I have just at the end, the effective date, didn't Monica say yesterday that she wanted it to take effect further because she needed some time or was that earlier on? That, that was the first meeting. Okay, the first, first, meeting. first meeting, okay. Mm -hmm. I will wait for everyone to tell me that they're at the end of page 13. Sorry. <laughs> oh, wow. There's no, there's not even a can of Diet Coke in the cafeteria. Sorry. <laughs> I was willing to go with the can, but they didn't have the cans. I know. There. I think three is now. Line 21 on page 12 is another one of those funding for evidence based. I did a word search, so I think I've caught them all now. Oh, you got them? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a good catch, um, Dan and Topper right. and Carl. And I want to say this reinforces the importance of us 
even after we've gone through it several times to really do what I call the silent reading. I like this process. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 We should do this all the time. Unless the bill is 125 <laughs> pages, it might take that's when, that's when I assign it to a group of people to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we are at the end of page 13. I would entertain a motion. I'll move to approve version 5.1 of H711. Second. Uh, um, a motion made by um, Representative Wood and seconded by um, Carl. Is there further discussion? <laughs> Sorry, Representative Rosenquist. <laughs> Where is he from? Yeah, I, I, I lost my representative <laughs> I, I don't know if you could hear us talk because you were across the way, but when Ann was wishing you happy birthday yesterday and she was like, uh, the representative from uh, and I said, Georgia. <laughs> oh, he was just, it was, we all have those moments. I just wanted to say my friend from committee. I know. <laughs> all these rules on the floor. Um, okay, we've got. Um, Madam yes. Chair, I have one thing that's been grinding in my mind. Okay. All the way through this thing. Um, I brought up earlier about uh, the, the having to be in the budget. You know, the, what it, the money is. Excuse me. I'll call you back later. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's, that's, what I just did is terrible. You know why? You know who that was? One of the autism parents. I was trying to not do that to them, and I just did it. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. There, it happened to be in the budget. What I'm worried about is if something comes up during the year, um, for instance, if there was a like a, a, a whole bunch of fentanyl um, deaths in one place. And, you know, some kind of intervention would have to take place. Do, you, do we feel that we've covered all the bases so that the money could be expended somehow? I'm, I'm just worried that when we say the, the expenditure has to be done through the budget of the health department. Uh, uh, Tapper, that's a pay grade mm -hmm. for a, a committee um, that I'm not familiar with, but I keep thinking that we have a joint fiscal committee that meets in the summer and that um, from time to time when we pass legislation um, or, when, or when we pass like the budget, we will put something in there. There's something in the budget about <laughs> joint fiscal committee or, you know, if something happens in the interim, the Joint Fiscal Committee meets and can do something. Um, it, it's a good question, and I'm sort of punting on my answer. Um, but I think there is, and I don't know how it works. I'll look to Legislative Council if they know. But there is a process the um, that has um, that we have used in the past for um, certain amounts of. Um, money towards a particular, to fund a particular mm -hmm. um, event. Um, that said, there's usually a, um, a limit. And it, the other thing that I, I would add, um, Topper, is that um, departments, when departments have certain responsibilities and they have the, um, they have the charge to carry out those responsibilities, they, they can get permission um, to spend um, in excess of what they have in their budget. 
and then deal with it through budget adjustments as well. So, you know, when we see budget adjustment coming in, um, lots of times those departments have already spent that money and now they're getting approval for it because it was in their area of response, you know, their locus of responsibility. Um, so I, I hear your, con your, your concern. I think it's a valid concern, but I think that they have processes um, already in place to be able to, you know, to deal with that sort of emergent issue that you're speaking of. And I'm wondering why that uh, the, the agency that we've been dealing, you and I have been dealing with, why they didn't use that that uh, opportunity when they kept saying they were running, they didn't have any money. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, yes, Sorry, Ray. But in the um, beginning of when we talk about, uh, when the bill talks about uh, expenditures in the categories, um, it's page eight, line 15 for me. There's um, evaluation activities are talked about in that section. And that's the only place throughout the bill where we talk about evaluation. And I wonder if we can add something at the end where, um, where is it, page 13, nine, um, line 13 for me, facilitating evidence-based data collection and research, analyzing the effectiveness. I wonder if we can add the word evaluation there. So, Where are you exactly? <laughs> I'm sorry. So page 13. It's page 13, uh, mm -hmm. number nine. Nine. Facilitating evidence-based or evidence-informed data collection, comma, evaluation, and research. Or it could be analyzing and evaluating. The analyzing and evaluating. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I was so happy that they had it there. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. You now have support on committee. Yeah, that's right. You can be on government accountability next. <laughs> um, we have a motion on the floor. It's um, and we've had discussion. Are we still on the same? draft. 5.1. What? 5.1. Yes. 5.1. Okay. So is there further discussion? Okay. Thank you. Um, if the clerk will begin to call the roll. Representative McFawn. Yes. yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Small. Yes. Representative Rosenquist. Yes. Representative Garanfano. Yes. Representative Whitman. Yes. Representative, sorry, Representative Paella. Yes. Representative Gregoire. Yes. Representative Noyes. Yes. Representative Brumstead. Yes. And Representative Pugh. Yes. 11 zero, zero. Now this is um, a committee bill that does not yet have a number and it it does have a number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thing we're talking about. Yes. <laughs> this is why there's 11 of us to keep these. Okay. Um, the process is that. Um, there's 12 of us, by the way. <laughs> that the reporter brings it to the clerk. Okay, so the reporter is, is Ray. <laughs> but go, yes, Julie. It's all it's still it. via email. It is. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's very easy. So, and you'll just send a clean copy. Yeah, Julie has a clean copy. I'll just send you directly the clean copy. Okay. And you will be asked what the vote is. Send it to me too, so I can put it yeah. in the book. Thank you. Yes, we'll do that. Um, and it will be on the calendar for, um, and it will be on the calendar for notice um, tomorrow, at which point it will be sent to appropriations. And in the meantime, we will hear back, you, you and I will hear back from government operations or a drive-by around the com around the committee, because that is their function. Um, 
given that it is Wednesday, I, I don't imagine it will be before the end of next week that we will be um, reporting this, if not after. Because I've heard from the chair of appropriations on Monday, she told me that they had 18, 14 or 18 or 22. Anyway, they have a huge number of bills in addition to the budget that they are um, needing to look at. I think it was 18. Yeah. That's what my roommate told me. <laughs> now it's at least 19. What? Now it's at least 19. No, no, she, well, I was saying, and we're oh, sending inclusive. you four. Oh. <laughs> and she, I said, so 22, and she oh. goes, no, we're counting. Oh. Because <laughs> I, but, no. Okay. Madam Chair, are we done with that one now? We are done with that one. <laughs> okay, good. I have a question for Julie. Uh, Julie, can you, can you hook me up with the most recent um, bill uh, on the, let's see, which is, the last thing I have, have is that on, on the disability, developmental disabilities bill, the one that got sent to the, um, to the clerk, because I think I'm working with the wrong one. Oh, no. Okay. Um, Please, can you just tell me how you. to get it and I'll get it. Okay, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm turning to legislative council. Um, can, can you change subjects now? I can. Okay. <laughs> All right, committee, we're gonna have, um, this will be a, probably a, a, a walkthrough and we'll get as far as we can um, of uh, the committee bill um, and act relating um, to opioid overdose response. And we have a, uh, um, a working draft uh, based on uh, 22-0621, is that big? Yeah. So yeah, this is the committee bill on point two. I know it says, it seems you were trying to act. Before I explain into this, I should just like, I have to, you can I, I can't hear you. Okay. I have to testify at um, 245 in another committee. That's I need okay. You got it. Run across the street. They want me to Zoom. Um, so I have to run across the street. And get they want you to Zoom? Oh, because their room is full or something. I'm not sure, um, but they have a- Okay, so we will, we will get as far as we can. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so we're looking at draft 1.2, um, and I'll just dive right in. So, and I, for whatever reason, yeah, I can't either. If you refresh, it comes up. Okay. So, Thank you. I, yeah, I had the same message. Okay. So. I was waiting for someone else to say. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So section one has to do with certain service programs. And the concept is by amending the definition, we're expanding the locations in which an organized community-based needle exchange program can operate. So specifically in that subdivision A2, there's existing language that says in, in defining what a program is and which is operated by an aid service organization, a substance abuse treatment provider or a licensed healthcare provider facility. So in removing that language that um, generates new opportunities um, for locations and um, um, providers that could offer a needle exchange program. Next. Could I just, on that, what, why are we taking out the aid service organization? Did you just say that? And I didn't. That's okay. I probably didn't um, describe it very clearly. So right now, the existing definition limits can operate a needle exchange program, and by taking that language out, it um, expands the opportunities for organizations or locations that want to host that type of program. So, so, it, so, uh, would it include an aid service? It could. Program? It doesn't preclude That's them at all. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay, next section two, peer delivered syringe exchange. 
Um, so there's existing law needle exchange programs that the Department of Health in collaboration with statewide harm with the statewide harm reduction coalition shall develop operating guidelines for needle exchange programs. And the new language is added, including peer delivered um, syringe exchange. So this would require the Department of Health to um, also be developing guidelines for peer delivered syringe exchange. Um, and then I have a question. What is peer delivered? I think it's defined later, isn't it? That's not on. Oh, down here. That's, that's very nice. Isn't it? Yep. It oh. Peers with lived experience of injection drug use perform outreach and provide sterile syringes prevention education. Okay. And resources. I hadn't read far enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I actually was ahead. Okay. <laughs> 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 Um, and I'll just flag back to subsection A that we're deleting that sentence. Um, such operating guidelines shall be established no later than September 30th, 1999, which is um, 20 years outdated. I, I'm going to assume <laughs> that we have operating guidelines. <laughs> okay. Um, section three um, report on the peer delivered syringe exchange guidelines. So I'll walk through the language and then I'll explain why this is here. Okay. Um, so this says that by October 1st of this coming year, the Department of Health shall submit guidelines for the peer delivered syringe exchange um, to the committees of jurisdiction. So as we were creating this section two up above and getting rid of the date by which the operating guidelines were supposed to be established, um, it's, it's not preferred drafting to have a date certain in the statutes because like in this situation, then we have it, you know, 20 years later and it's sort of irrelevant at that point. So my thought was instead of having a date certain, what if we just had a report date by which the guidelines had to be done and then you're putting in your date that you want it done, but not embedding it into the statute itself, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Next section four prior authorization for MAT. Okay, so we're amending an existing section. So we're keeping this um, initial lead in language in subsection A, which applies to a health insurance plan shall not require prior authorization for prescription drugs for a patient who is receiving MAT if the dosage prescribed is within FDA dosing recommendations or during the first 60 days MAT when the medication is prescribed for opioid or opiate withdrawal. Are, are we asking questions now or later? Um, Let, I'd like to get through the thing. Is that OK, yeah. why don't we keep track of our okay. questions? Because I think also um, as a precursor to this, this is the result of um, a, a group of three to four members of the committee putting stuff together. And much like <laughs> when we sort of began the reach up discussion, it was bigger than what we ended up with. Um, this may become bigger than what is here, or it may become smaller. But so I would keep track of our questions. And this, because this is draft one. Uh, subsection B, health insurance plan shall cover the following medications without requiring prior authorization. Um, one medication within each therapeutic class of medication approved by the FDA for the treatment of substance use disorders. And second, one medication that is a formulation of a buprenorphine monoproduct approved by the FDA for the treatment of substance use disorders. Next is the creation. So what's the difference between those two? It seemed like therapeutic class would include yeah. two. Okay. Yeah, so I could venture. Um, the therapeutic classes, um, my understanding would be basically all buprenorphine products. Um, we heard in our testimony from the provider last, before we left for a break, that um, a mono buprenorphine product is kind of a, a separate thing because it doesn't include Narcan. And so a patient's experience of it 
will be different. Right. So this is just ensuring that we include one buprenorphine product, which could be like uh, buprenorphine and fentanyl, and the mono product is just buprenorphine. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to section five. This creates an overdose prevention site working group. Um, the lead in language in subsection A and recognition that fatal overdoses in Vermont are rapidly increasing with a record amount of opioid related deaths in 2021. There is created the overdose prevention site working group to identify the feasibility of implementing overdose prevention sites in Vermont. And we have the membership of the group. Uh, first, the Commissioner of Health or designee, Commissioner of Public Safety or designee, Attorney General or designee, a member of the House appointed by the Speaker, a member of the Senate appointed by the Committee on Committees, two individuals with lived experience of substance use disorder nominated by syringe service programs and appointed by the Commissioner of Health, and the program directors of the Consortium on Substance Use, the Howard Center Safe Recovery Program, the HIV HCV Resource Center, and Vermont CARES or their designees. Is that supposed to be Vermont Care Partners, or is that correct, Vermont Cares? Vermont know. Cares. That's correct. Okay. Now, this is just setting up a group to discuss this. Issue. Correct. It's not, it's not forming. No, this is a center. working group. I'm still group. concerned about the potential liability to yes. the yeah. group. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I missed a member, uh, a representative of Vermont Legal Aid. Mm -hmm. What's there? A representative of Princeton. And then... I'm, were you saying something? I, I just, she said she missed it, but she, I. Oh, I missed You made it out loud. It out loud. <laughs> okay. It's there, but I didn't say it out loud. Um, okay. Subsection C, powers and duties. The working group shall identify the feasibility of implementing overdose prevention sites and make recommendations on executive and legislative actions necessary to implement overdose prevention. Assistance will have the assistance of the health department report by November 15 of 2023, the working group shall submit a written report to the committees of jurisdiction with its findings and any recommendations for legislative action. The commissioner of health or designee is to call the first meeting on or before September 15th of this year. And the committee uh, selects a chair from among its members. Majority of the membership constitutes a quorum and the group ceases to exist November 15, 2023 uh, when the report is due. And then for compensation and reimbursement, we have um, the standard language um, for eight meetings. Um, oops, and I have a, um, and subdivision two, sorry, I didn't put and, and there's a slash there. So it should be entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses. Um, and um, for the legislative members, the appropriation is made out of um, General Assembly's budget and for other members out of the Department of Health's budget. And then in subsection H, um, the overdose prevention site means a facility where individuals can use previously purchased regulated drugs as defined in statute. Can I just understand that? I mean, uh, but most of these drugs are, right, uh, are not legal. Correct, correct. So, but it's saying purchase regulated drugs, but but they're they're not legal. So I just went, how do we cover that? Um, so this would refer to sites where people are using Ill illegally or, or drugs that are illegal, but they have previously purchased them and brought them to the site. And this is a working group to sort of work on the issues of whether those types of sites are um, still the working group. Still the working group yeah. But I think part of um, part of Carl's question is he says previously purchased regulated drugs. On the face of it yeah. reads that I went to the drugstore and purchased them. They sound legal. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. It, it, it sounds like that they're purchasing le it legally. And I don't know what as defined in. Um, well, is there um, a definition for regulated drugs? Well, yeah, there is regulated oh, drugs. Required. Um, well, I think regulated drugs is a term of art. This language wasn't um, not 
I, I consulted with Michelle, who is the oh, expert. Great. So okay. um, I feel more comfortable, but I can pull up the definition of 4201 so we can take a look. Okay, so this comes from a chapter on possession and control of regulated drugs, 4201 definitions. So I have seen elsewhere the definition to be illicit recreational drugs, I mean, those, the facility described as that. that okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I would probably pull in Michelle if you dive into this, but um, this definition means a narcotic drug, a depressant or stimulant drug other than methamphetamine, a hallucinogenic drug, ecstasy, cannabis, or methamphetamine. I guess it's the word purchase, which yeah. concerns me in, in terms of its legality. In other oh, words, I know. see. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, that's, I'm okay. trying to get at that. I think you and I are on the same page. Sorry, I missed that question. Um, so individuals are previously acquired. Okay. I'll make that change now. Okay. Can use previously acquired regulated drugs. Okay. Thank you. Um, next uh, is an appropriation section. This is really a section of three different programs. They all require appropriations, which is why it's sort of titled appropriation. Um, so the first is an appropriation for a mobile medic uh, MAT unit. Um, so for fiscal year 23, an undisclosed amount is appropriated from the general fund um, to ADAP for the purpose of awarding one or more grants for mobile MAT services in accordance with federal laws. The division shall award grants based on the applicant's ability to provide MAT, including methadone, to currently underserved areas of the state. Do we need to address the name of ADAP mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or its successor? Um, we could say our successor. I wasn't as concerned here because this is in um, session law, so it doesn't sort of live on past this fiscal year, but we can put or successor if, if that this feels better. Um, Katie, I'm, I'll say it now. Um, I really hope we can have a, if we go down this route, that we can have a different heading than appropriation. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, I will flag that. You know, I, I mean, I realize they're all, appro you know. Um, um, uh, are they pilots? Pilot program? Um, might be pilots um, or, you know, something. And um, why don't I put pilot programs and pilot no. programs and maybe not start with the word appropriation? Same thing in seven, right? It's the same thing in seven and eight, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll call it pilot programs for now or place appropriation with pilot program. And I'll flag it so we can take a second look at it. Yeah. Can't we use funds for, could we recommend use of funds from the bill that we just voted out for this type of program? Thing is, this is intended to be put in place uh, July 1st, and we won't be getting opioid settlement funds until after that date. And the Appropriations Committee may decide to that your idea makes a lot of sense and to put it yeah. out. Yeah. Maybe that's why we put appropriate out. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like and six or or successor or just keep it as is? It's in, it's in session law, so I think I think it's not as important. Not, okay. Okay. Um, next is the pilot program for Section Seven, um, substance use support for justice involved Vermonters. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up with changing to pilot program. Okay, in fiscal year uh, twenty three. 250,000 is appropriated from the general fund to ADAP for, uh, to award one or more grants to an organization or organizations providing substance use treatment counseling or substance use recovery support or both for individuals within and transitioning out of the criminal justice system. The division shall award grants based on an applicant's ability to accomplish the following. 
first. Can I just ask there, I mean, can we put in language that references possible other funds than general fund? Yes. You know, mm -hmm. to say general general fund and or other possible sources. Mm -hmm. Um sure. Uh, so the reason general fund is highlighted is because I, I I felt like that was an outstanding question. I just plugged in general fund yeah. because I didn't have another other directions. Um, so why don't I keep it highlighted for now? I'm sorry. Why don't I keep it highlighted in the draft for now to kind of flag that as something to come back to? <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. So accomplish the following. First. Provide justice involved people with direct substance use support services while incarcerated, such as through alcohol and drug abuse counselors or certified recovery coaches or both. Second, support justice involved individuals in their transition out of incarceration, such as through referrals to existing statewide resources for substance use treatment or recovery. Or lastly, third, provide long term support for justice involved individuals, such as by coordinating peer support services or ongoing counseling um, post incarceration. Just real quick. Mm -hmm. So, in line 10, I just want to make sure you misspoke and that I don't have a wrong version. So, you said alcohol and drug abuse counselors. But drug was, counselors, I'm sorry, alcohol and drug sure. counselors. Yep, that's the term in um, Title 26, licensed alcohol and drug. Is that right? Drug counselors. I think it might actually be the abuse. Yeah, now that you're saying that. Yeah, okay, I need to go. Okay, I'll just highlight it for now and I'll go back and check. Thank you for flagging that. And then just quick uh, line 14, I think it's just a typo. Um, it says, such as the referrals, is that through, through referrals? Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, next, I'm going to get rid of in section eight, I'm going to replace appropriation with pilot program. And this has to do with overdose emergency response support in, fis in fiscal year, this fiscal year, or this coming fiscal year, 180,000 is appropriated from the general fund to ADAP to award four equal grants to organizations providing substance use treatment or recovery services in coordination with emergency responses to overdose. The division shall award grants based on applicants ability to support individuals at risk of fatal overdose by facilitating warm handoffs and coordinating between stakeholders and public safety, emergency medical services, substance use treatment and healthcare providers and substance use recovery centers. And then we have the effective date. <laughs> One hand up. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that. What I actually was thinking is in the last draft, we didn't hyphenate it. In this draft, we do. <laughs> I wonder what happens. Oh, nice Google. Fast forward. I know. <laughs> I want to be here. It's a whole too. Yeah. Yeah, um, Teresa would like us to go back to page four. Really? That's when we were holding our question. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I did follow instructions. <laughs> I don't think anyone's following instructions right now. Well, you know, it, 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 it only happens very rarely. <laughs> so I just thought I everyone. Uh, okay, page four, where in that first paragraph in A. Um, so I'm kind. I, I just. I guess I need more explanation about what this is doing. Um, so. So right now, the current language shall not require prior authorization if it's in accordance with the FDA dosing recommendations. And so then we're adding during the first 60 days. So it's going to be prescribed by a doctor, but they're going to do it outside of the current FDA dosing recommendations. Is that what that's trying to get at? Um, I'll make it up. Yeah. So. Um, essentially what this is looking at is how do we increase access, especially during those most vulnerable times when somebody's first considering treatment, right? Um, so prior authorization, that process is basically a point at which an insurance company will review a prescription to take a look at it. And there are a lot of other considerations that um, insurance companies can take into account other than dosage. And uh, I think 
we've heard people talking a lot about what's the preferred versus non-preferred medication, um, things along those lines, and also looking at some things related to um, cost. I think the reality of the situation, while the existing statute um, falls within, I, I understand where your question is coming from, but that there's thousands of prior authorizations taking place, 95% of them are being approved. And so this is just trying to look at some additional measures to put in place uh, to ensure that people have rapid access to uh, medication assisted treatment when they need it. So if that's what the intent is, then um, because I think it could be read um, and based upon Taylor's look um, <laughs> when I asked the question that maybe is the intent for it to be the way it is. And I guess I just want, I want to know if it's both if it's both prescribing outside of the FDA recommendations and increasing access during those first 60 days. So under this, uh, yes, under this description, and Katie, correct me if I'm wrong, um, somebody would within the initial 60 days, if they prescribed over that uh, USDA recommendation, it would not be subject to prior authorization. Right. It's it's an, it's an additional point. So you have um, it's sort of like more inclusive of times in which you would not have prior authorization. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. crystal clear. Because there's a difference between quantity and access to the the. Um, the approved quantity, you know, if going over quantity puts you into another category. Right. I just wanted to make sure that when I'm voting on this, that I know what I'm voting, voting on. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, that's, and I think this is something that this is one of the thing, one of the pieces. I mean, we need to take some, we're hopefully getting people in tomorrow okay. to talk about um, this. Because I, I mean, I do recall the testimony that we had prior to break that spoke about both mm -hmm. um, and spoke about the, you know, that when, when we asked what are the things we could do, you know, that that was on the list. And it's right. just, um, uh, so so I'm, like I said, well, I'm just talking, trying to understand yeah, well, exactly what I'd be voting. Yeah. I, I thought it had to do with the fact that uh, the normal, uh, what do you call it, FDA prescribed dosage might be up to nine strips at a time or something. Or That's the technology. Or there could be somebody that needs <laughs> 13. Right. Okay. And would this cover that person? Th that's that would. That's yeah. the hope. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I, what we heard from Blue Cross Blue Shield was that they did not have prior authorization of a drug. Mm -hmm. That they had no prior authorization. Now, of course, Medicaid does, but we'll ignore right. that fact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, but that um, if you wanted to prescribe different than what was usual and customary, that there would have to be some kind of prior, um, there's, there would need to be approval. Right, so mm -hmm. so can I ask another follow-up question then related to that? So if, if this stays the way it is and the uh, uh, prescribing authority is able to prescribe something that's not within the current FDA guidelines in that first 60 days, mm -hmm. but does this then require them to uh, then go back to the FDA, or is it just require them to make the case about why they're prescribing what they're prescribing? The latter. Yeah. So okay. the prior authorization would happen 60 days afterwards, but the 60 days allows for one, finding the right dosage for the individual, mm -hmm. um, but hopefully reducing that barrier to induce someone onto MAT, so not having that prior authorization up front, but getting the person on, finding the dosage, and then after 60 days, either they're in the FDA realm and they won't need a prior off or that they would have the prior authorization come at that time. Dane. I think another component of this that we heard um, in a meeting with Blue Cross Blue Shield is that I think the concern is really, um, you know, so if somebody's going to be prescribed a higher dose than what's FDA recommended, what are the sorts of processes in place? Um, and there's a separate process called quantity limits, I believe was what they talked about. So prior authorization is prior to even getting your prescription through. 
there's a separate process that is once you go to the pharmacy that um, there can be a quantity limit that's in place at which point that goes through its own review process, which can then be you know appealed. Sometimes it's another quick kind of thing where the, uh, the provider sort of checks it off and it's okay. Um, but to just keep in mind that that process will still be in place. We're just basically when somebody's in the waiting room of their provider that they won't need to go through prior authorization. So I'll be, uh, I will acknowledge you just confused me yeah. um, because now it made it sound like if the quantity wasn't within, you know, the FDA guidelines. guidelines that at the pharmacy, you might get like, I'm sorry, I can only issue X, Y, or Z. So are we setting up another barrier? Well, that's just the way it, we're not setting that up. No, I know that exists. So we're, I guess what I'm saying, are we, are we not removing, are we not really removing that barrier about quantity is my question. Yeah, so we are removing um, the barrier for prior authorization, right? And so that's when they're in the waiting room. And then, yes, there's another process that people go through when they meet with their, um, basically when they go to the pharmacist. Under this statute, we're not affecting that in any way. Um, and so... I think that's up for consideration. If that's something that we want to dive into, I think that we just recognize that that initial component where somebody is in the waiting room of their provider is what we're addressing. We are, but that's not really going to do anything if they get to the pharmacy and they can't get what they need right then. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, this is, this, this is why the pieces are in here for us to have a discussion gotcha. okay. about what we can do sort of right now. Um, and part of what, I mean, Dane and uh, Jessica and Taylor and um, Kelly. Kelly and Kelly worked over the over the break, over ten meeting recess on different sort of ideas. Um, I will take full responsibility. One of the ideas that was presented um, from the person who uh, commented was to remove the um, sunset on the, the, um, the on the Butte mm -hmm. bill. And uh, I, 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 um, I exercised the chair's <laughs> thing to take it out of the draft because we don't sunset until 2023. And um, it didn't seem like it was going to do anything right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that what we're talking about is right now. And um, the Senate was the body that put the time limit in there. And um, I can almost guarantee that, the, um, that there has been no evaluation mm -hmm. yet. So I was like, this is not a, a fight we need to have. Right, we don't and so, I, so that was an idea put out. And I was like, you know, um, there is a process in place for us to evaluate it next year. Right. But so, it, it's a little too early. It's right. too early to pull it out. Now. Right. I mean, I, I get all that. I just, you know, I think what I am sort of, I am 100% okay with the concept. Uh, I just, mm. if we're not really doing it, then um, if, we're, if we're saying like, okay, here's what the barriers are, we're going to take away half of them. Mm -hmm. um, we're not taking away the other half, you know. Then, and we did when we talked to Blue Coast. I'm going to put oh, yeah. And Katie, you need to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you need to go, and so we can we can continue to have our conversation. But I know you need to be somewhere else, and um, we'll be giving you mixed messages. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So this this draft, just to kind of close the loop on the process, you're coming back to this draft tomorrow morning. Are we coming back after this? Laura, it says TBT is currently in our schedule. No, no, oh, oh, no um, uh, we do not. Um, well, I guess, I mean, tomorrow morning, we are hoping to hear from, um, the, um, from the Department of Health. Okay, okay. So you don't need a new draft first thing in the morning. No, they, they have seen, that, I mean, the, this draft is on the um, webpage. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Have a nice day. Um, um, the, the, the TBD was whether we thought it was necessary to come back after 
um, the floor without knowing what the floor was going to be, um, which I still am a little unclear what is happening on the floor. Other people may know. Um, I think we might have time in the morning um, to continue our discussion around this bill and what's missing, if anything, you know, what else can we do um, or how do we want to hone in? Yeah, I mean, for, for the people who weren't involved, this is the first time that we're seeing right, exactly, it. Yeah. Exactly, and then, exactly, exactly. Can I just say two quick things? One, finish up with um, your question. When we met with Blue Cross Blue Shield, one thing I was struck by exactly what you're saying, but my sense was, and Dean, please correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the doctor who was on the call and the pharmacist who was on the call were not sure that that's what was happening. And they were going to talk more to each other and let us know whether or not there was that weirdness of it could be approved here and then not approved when the person walked in and gave the script to the pharmacy. And so there's more to come because then they also wondered what Diva was doing and we weren't totally sure. And we said we were gonna hear more testimony on that. So I think that's why it's a little confusing. That was my sense. Yeah. I mean, so these scripts usually go directly from the physician to the pharmacy. Right. Um, it's, so it's kind of, yeah, I just, I, uh, that's how it's helpful. Thank you for sharing the uh, results of your conversation. I, I'm still left with a question about whether we're really doing what we think that we're, we're doing. doing. Yeah, and I think we are too. We were too, is my point, I guess. And then my other comment is, again, I held my questions to the end. And um, I just wondered about on page five of nine, the membership of the working group, is that there's not really one of the groups that's, that's pretty active in all of all of this work specifically is the emergency rooms and the community health centers, yes. like the physicians in those two places, and yet they're not represented in this group. And I just thought that they might want to think about that. I mean, who was on the group and then? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, would, I, um, I had a comment about that section as well in, in that. We just spent a lot of time figuring out who should nominate who and the language and stuff. It feels like we should make our language in this consistent with the language that we just hashed out in yeah. 7-Eleven. Yeah. Which it's not. Right. No, yeah. I think that that's. I agree with you on that one. Uh, uh, there, there, I mean, um, there are enough different people, different groups of people who are raising the question of whether or not um, it's the role of the state, whether or not um, to have these um, facilities, these sites, that I think it is time for us to help direct that by having a study. Um, and as Carl pointed out, there's lots of questions, mm -hmm. whether it's liability, whether it is you know, something that's going to encourage or what, you know, just whatever. And there are places around the country. And there's a part of me that would want to be more explicit in their charge, which is to have them talk to, I mean, there are places in the United States, there are cities in the United States right now that are doing this. And so to be more explicit um, about assessing that, um, because th this is controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people may be worried. And, and, and sometimes when we say, let's look at something, they go, we don't want to look at it because we don't want the um, outcome. Um, exactly. And I don't know what the outcome will be, but there are places, and not just in foreign countries. Right. <laughs> you know, I, mean, that, I mean, it used to be, I mean, that there were foreign countries that did before that, and, and but they're a foreign country. They're not the U.S. Right. And they're yeah, you know, so there's and and they're not all in New York City. So and I think that I was a minivan, we could go on. <laughs> well, and that's why I think that we might need a good facilitator to be appointed to this group because people right now, it doesn't matter who you talk to, it seems they have very strong opinions one way or the other. So putting together those two groups 
into one group and saying, come out with a resolution might be really difficult without strong facilitation <laughs> skills. Um, recognizing that we have limited time, I will just say that the large question that is out in community right now is whether there is legislative action that needs to be taken or should be taken around overdose prevention sites. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why the task that I put into this was really the feasibility and looking at, is it a legislative thing or as some folks have discussed on community, is this a, a locality and a municipality piece where actually it's hands off on the legislature's end and just allowing folks to move forward and what that all could look like. Um, I also know the membership needs to change because in talking with the attorney general's office, they said they would not like to be involved and pass it on down to the state's attorneys. Um, so. <laughs> Yes, he. Yeah. So they, mm -hmm. they tell us that'll wrap it up for a couple of years. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we give him the deadline, Carl. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this is your first time, see, you know, many of people's first time seeing it. Um, we have um, legislative time. <laughs> um, uh, not, you know, until Friday at five or four thirty to pass something out. Um, uh, if people want to send this, the draft that is on um, our um, on our webpage to anyone that you think needs to see it, who might have an opinion or might have another idea, um, that is something that we will in fact consider that is focused on immediacy and opioids and fentanyl, because that's was sort of our. Mm. Is this up on our site now? Or it is. It is up on our site, um, but it, it's. Um, um, I wonder, um, Julie, is there a way in putting it up on our site it, uh, that you can also name it? Sure. You know, I mean, it, it, it has the draft number. You yeah. know, blah 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 blah, blah but it doesn't have a, You know, something. Blah 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 is a number. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and, um, and, and, and in a few minutes, okay, so now we're gonna change subjects. <laughs> um, so Representative McFawn and I did a drive-by through on 720, the DD bill um, with government operations. And um, they have a, they, first off the good news is that they did a straw poll and it was unanimous 11-0, um, but they um, do have a suggestion um, that we prepare an amendment to our bill to specify that the steering committee has a sunset date. Um, okay. They did not feel it was specific enough. Okay. Um, so That's it, easy. Uh, it's uh, a, an easy thing to do. Yes. Um, uh, Topper, did, did you have anything else that you thought we should report back it seemed like that was the they had a lot of questions i'm going to say they didn't it was not like you know oh yeah thanks <laughs> they grilled us for half an hour but um it was uh uh they they were supportive yeah when they grilled you for half an hour was it on the bill as a whole or was it on the committee I, I, in terms of preparation when we have to go to um, again. They asked specific questions about specific elements of the bill. So they asked us to do, you know, an overview about what the what the bill does. And this is my actually my first time presenting to GovOps. Um, so uh, and then um, so we did the overview and um, and then we took questions. And so there were questions like, you know, what does plain language mean? Um, what um, that the steering committee and the dates and you know uh, was the report the end of the steering committee and um, why did we need this um, you know so those those types of questions okay. um, not um, and I I was noticing it in this bill that there is a uh, there's a date there's dates and there's <laughs> all those things that seem to be um, we said that it ended after eight meetings and they were uh, because we, we say they can only meet eight times, but that was not specific enough for the um, um, the vice chair felt very um, strongly that we needed a sunset day. Otherwise, um, they could have one meeting it's different. It's different. Right. It could be one meeting a year for eight years or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. 
So we, we um, if the committee is in agreement with that, we can certainly work on an amendment with Ledge Council to that effect. Absolutely. Okay. And that was it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, before we go, I just want to make sure in the clerk that we, we let the clerk's office know that the bill is coming. It's on the calendar. Program. All set. <laughs> nice. Okay. Work. You made it very easy. We don't have to come back after floor. Um, we do not have to come back after floor. Um, but we do need to be here at 8 30 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, and with that, we are, uh, yeah, no, that's with that, we are finished oh. for today.